Hi, I'm Gary. I'm an ordinary bloke doing stuff. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. Today is one of those exciting days where I get to have a look at a brand new kit, one that has just been released by Airfix. This one is a 172nd scale Hawker Tempest Mark V. Now we're going to have a quick look at the history of the Tempest and then we'll have a look at what's in this new kit, have a close look at how good the moulds are, things like that. Uh, then I'll show you how to make one of these. And if after that you want to buy one, there's a link in the information box below where you can click on to go to the Airfix website and buy one. Now, if you do that at no extra cost to you, this channel gets a few pennies to pay for some more kits and some more videos. So that's a good thing. If you enjoy it, also remember, down in the bottom right corner, that way, there's my logo. Click on that to subscribe to my channel and see lots of other builds and other projects as they're completed. Okay, let's get going. The Hawker Tempest was conceived to address issues encountered in the earlier Typhoon, especially its poor high altitude performance. The new aircraft used a thinner laminar flow design of wing with sufficient other changes to warrant a new name. The Air Ministry ordered six prototypes with various engine configurations. The Tempest 1 had an APA Sabre 4 engine, but with the radiator in the wing instead of under the chin. The Tempest 2 was fitted with the Bristol Centaurus radial engine. The Tempest 3 and 4 were both intended for the Rolls-Royce Griffin, as used in later marks of Spitfire, the Tempest 3 having a contra-rotating propeller, and the Tempest 5 had the Sabre 2 engine with the chin radiator. The Tempest 5 prototype was the first to fly in September 1942. Originally it had a car-style hinge door and a framed canopy. This was soon disposed of in favour of a clear bubble canopy. The first production Tempest 4 flew in June 1943. The first squadron to be equipped was number 3, closely followed by 486 Squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force and 56 Squadron RAF. Together these formed 150 Wing, in 1944 based at RAF New Church in Kent under the command of Roland B. Beaumont. B would later find fame as a test pilot for English Electric, notably of the Canberra, the Lightning and the TSR-2. Duties of 150 Wing included high altitude fighter sweeps and long range interdiction strikes into enemy held territory. In June 1944, the Germans unleashed the V 1 flying bomb. The Tempest proved extremely valuable in shooting these down, either with cannon or by tipping their wings over so that they fell out of the sky. Tempest 5s continued to fly as part of 2nd Tactical Air Force for the remainder of the war, attacking German rail and road communications and shooting down high-performance enemy aircraft such as the ME-262 fighter. By the end of the war, some 800 Tempest 5s had been built, yet only three survive. Two are currently in restoration, one hopefully to flying condition, and another may be seen in the RAF Museum in Hendon, North London, in its post-war use as a target tug. The kit box opens at the top, like this. Inside the box we get the clear sprue, the grey plastic sprues, the instruction leaflet and of course the decal sheet. There are four grey plastic sprues with all the parts for this kit plus a few extra bits for other versions that might be released later. The large parts seem designed well with reasonably deep panel lines. This will make detailing easier for the majority of modellers. The fuselage walls are so-so, you know, but at least there's something there, and again, helps the average modeler. An interesting feature is that the base of the cockpit is moulded into the upper wing. Not sure yet whether that's a good idea. The pilot figure is small and poorly moulded. I know the likes of B. Beaumont didn't exactly tend to run to much height, but this fellow seems very small. Same thing on the Mosquito model, if you remember. When put next to the control column, it looks ridiculous. Compared with the figure in, say, the FX P40 Warhawk, this is a pretty poor effort. 
Now the exhausts for the engine come in two parts on each side. This makes it possible to replicate the shape of the exhausts in injected polystyrene. Normally, to get this shape, you'd probably need an aftermarket resin kit. It's a nice solution to the problem, and I think it's something we also saw on New Mosquito. There are two spinners in this kit, one for each of the schemes, which is a bit of a nice attention to detail. What is unusual is to see the parts for two underwing tanks on the transparency sprue. Maybe they just didn't have room elsewhere. There are also two sets of wheels. These smaller four-spoke ones have the Dunlop logo on them. To be fair, I think the better solution at this scale is a decal. But anyway, this version of the Tempest 5 uses these larger five-spoke wheels. And finally, on each sprue, there's a recycling logo. Check with your local authority that they can recycle unexpanded polystyrene or class 6 plastic, which, in my part of the world, they do. OK, that's the parts. Let's see what else we get. Of course, there's the traditional ethics instruction leaflet. As usual, it's well drawn, fairly logical, although with one huge error in step 9, as we'll see later. Otherwise, very clear and very easy to follow. Also included in the instructions are the scheme layouts. The first is scheme A, aircraft JN751, as flown by B. Beaumont when he was leading 150 wing around D-Day in 1944. Scheme B is JN766, an aircraft of 486 Squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force in April 1944. That's before D-Day, of course, hence the absence of the black and white invasion stripes. Finally, there's the decal sheet itself. As usual these days, very well printed, very sharp, with good colour and good colour registration. At the top of the sheet are the common decals. These include the stencils, there's quite a lot of them here, the blue tail band and the yellow stripes for the wing leading edge. Next is B's aircraft with the black and white invasion stripes. I'm not going to use these so I'm going to paint the stripes on myself. And then finally the markings for the 486 Squadron machine. All of this is finished off with a very nice piece of box art. So let's see how I put it all together. As usual, I've washed the parts with a gentle detergent and then when dry, added a light layer of grey primer. I'm going to start by painting the interior parts on the sprue. Some bits are green, others black. For the interior green, I use Vallejo IDF green, which seems to match the RAF colour really well. When these are all dry, I can place the seat onto its support and then I'll assemble the roof and front of the tailwheel bay. While those are setting up, I'll fit the filter to the front of the radiator panel. Then a the rear piece fits on the back like this. The gun sight and compass come as a single transparent piece that sits behind the instrument panel and it needs to be painted black. Now the instruments, and I'm going to take the decals off the sheet and then trim them down into three sections. This will make the fit much better. Next I'm painting the radiator assembly with burnt iron, which I think is a much nicer colour than gunmetal. After that I need to drill a couple of holes in the fuselage, one for the pilot step beneath the fuselage and the other for an aerial on top. A 0.6mm drill does the trick. After that I'll fit the seat into place with two alignment holes on the fuselage. The radiator assembly can go into the chin and the tail wheel well into the rear of the fuselage. Then put the instrument panel in place and the two halves of the fuselage can go together. Do make sure you check the alignment of all the pieces, especially the pegs on the seat and the position of the instrument panel. When you're happy with the fit, tape and clamp the fuselage up and let it dry. Next I'll start on the lower wing. Now if you're doing the kit with the gear up, you can fit these gear doors flush with the wing now. 
Also you'll need to drill out two holes each of two millimeters diameter if you're using a stand. I'm not doing any of that so I'll kick on by adding the 20mm gun barrels into the wings. The outer barrels poke out farthest. Then this structural support can go in. It forms the gear well walls and also part of the exhaust from the radiator. Now we need to drill a couple of more holes. One on the wing is for the pitot tube. 0.6mm drill bit required. Next a hole for the IFF aerial. Now the instructions say you need a 1.7mm diameter hole. You most certainly do not. I'd use a 0.6mm drill just like all the other holes. Next are some lamp covers. I use some blue tack on a cocktail stick to place them. Push them into seat firmly and then add just the tiniest dab of ultra thin glue. Or you can use a PVA glue like contact to clear. I always add some silver to the back of lamp covers for extra shine. Then the upper half of the wings can go into place, tape them up and let them set. Back to the fuselage now and there's this top frame for the canopy surround. It's a good close fit. You need to poke the gun sight through the hole towards the front then push it gently into place. If you push too far, you can reach through from the underside with tweezers or a thin stick to push it back out again. The top of the wing is also the floor of the cockpit, so it's been painted interior green with aluminium for the foot tracks. The rudder bar goes on top, followed by the control column. With those in place, you can fit the wings to the fuselage. The front of the wing assembly, the radiator exhaust, gets pushed in first. Now make sure the control column isn't too far back or it won't clear the pilot's seat when you pivot the rear of the wing assembly up into place. Once you're in, you can adjust the control column with tweezers if you like. Next is the exhaust flap for the radiator. It needs to be pulled up into slots but I found it easier to get it roughly in position, then push it into place from the inside with tweezers. Now with all that drama done, I'll start on some odd jobs like painting the wheels in steel. You could of course use the aluminium we used in the cockpit earlier. The tail wheel comes in two halves that need to be joined together, and when it's dry, you can paint this in steel as well. While you're at it, you may as well paint all the undercarriage pieces. While those dry, I'll add the rudder to the back of the fuselage like this. Then I can go back to the tyres and finish them in tyre black. My next job is to mask the canopy as I'm spraying my kit. I use PVC tape, just lay along the canopy lines, use a sharp cocktail stick to press into the frame lines and gently trim with a very sharp pointed blade. When they're done, the windshield and canopy can go on with some PVA glue. The canopy I'm using is closed anyway. If you're going to have it open, you might want to put some tape over the hole. So now for painting. Another gentle base of grey primer, then I'll start on the white for the stripes and the leading edge of the wings and the prop spinner. They'll all need a couple of coats. Next I'll mask off the white, add a band of light blue to the tail. And I'll add the yellow onto the leading edges of the wings and the prop spinner. When those have dried, I'll mask them off as well. And I'll start on the underside medium sea grey. Now I'll give that a bit of time to set, so while it's drying, another task is to start the propeller. I'm using Humble 33 black with a brush, then adding white to the tips. This will make the yellow stand out later on. When I'm happy that the underside's properly dry, I can mask it off and start on the ocean grey for the upper surface. 
there's really not so much left after everything else has been covered up. And then when that's dry, I'll mask off for the camouflage pattern. So now I'm ready for the last coat, dark green. I've kept the tail planes on the sprue as it's easier to mask the tail area without them on the kit. After a while to let all that settle, maybe a meal break or even overnight, I can start the big reveal and gently peel off all these masks. I think the result looks pretty cool. I'll give it a light coat of satin varnish at this point. Now while the varnish is drying I'll go back to the propellers and add the yellow to the tips. Now you can see now how bright it appears. Back to the dried body and I've masked out the areas for the black invasion stripes. The whole stripe patch is about 32mm wide so I've used stripes 6.5mm wide all over. This matches pretty close to the decals and a pretty fair result I think you'll agree. So now I can start adding some decals. I use a decal setting solution, I use Microset, to help the larger decals set into the panel lines. I think this is where the plane really comes alive. Just take your time, the tiny stencils are quite a job, but you can decide whether or not to use them. It's your model, it's your choice. And while the decals are setting up, I'm gonna start assembling the undercarriage, all of which is pre-painted. First, the legs go onto the main doors. Then this tiny outer door hooks into the top of the end of the wheel well. Then the main gear leg goes in next to it with its own locator slot. Just give it a gentle push into place. It's really firm. With the main legs in, there are actuator arms to fit. The first of these was fiddly as the part wasn't bent in the right places, but it went in eventually. I really should have done some dry fitting. Next is a small actuator at the back of the inside edge and this is used to support the inner gear door. Now I can put the main wheels on. They have flat spots on them so make sure they align correctly. This could have done with a better shaped axle and hole to set the alignment for you. Next I'm going to put in the IFF aerial and the step for the pilot. In hindsight I'd probably leave these until the very end because they're going to get knocked about. The tail wheel sets in place very easily and it has two doors that slot on either side. Unusually these fit really quite well with decent sized tabs that do engage properly. Then the exhausts just lay one half on top of the other and dab with ultra thin glue then press firmly together. Let them dry, then paint them burnt iron. Putting the propeller together, and the propeller sits quite firmly on this back plate, and then the spinner just sits on top. There's this large drum shaped part. The prop shaft goes through it, the propeller fits onto the shaft, only a tiny dab of glue on the top if you want the prop to turn. Then the drum shaped bit can be glued into the nose. Again, be careful not to put glue on the back plate if you want the prop to turn. With everything almost done, I can fit the tail planes or horizontal stabilizers if you will. They've thoughtfully been marked S for starboard and P for port. Then I'll do a final coat of matte varnish. After that I can slot the exhausts into place. They sit really quite deeply into these recesses. Then the masks can come off the cockpit. Be very careful not to scratch the plastic. Quick dabs of silver with transparent green and red for the wingtip lights and my Tempest 5 is done. There are some very good things about this kit. The exhaust stubs, the undercarriage, 
the general fit that needed no filler at all on the fuselage. But there are some pretty poor things. The pilot figure is awful. The gun sight transparency part was bent so it doesn't sit well. And putting the wing on the fuselage required the stick to be pushed forward, which is a pain if it's already set. Oh, and the printing error in the instructions about drilling a hole. But overall, a very fine kit, one I really enjoyed making. If you've enjoyed watching it, then please do remember to subscribe to my channel, where you'll find plenty of other builds and other projects as they're completed. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>